in. And the Lord took me through this book as I was doing my, my studies on uh, I was doing my studies on a larger topic of biblical music. You know, what is music for? Why is it in the church? How is it used? What are we to do? It's very simple, right? Music is praise, thanksgiving to God. Right? Who he is and what he's done. It's a very simple concept, right? You see, the children of Israel, the longest book in the Bible was devoted to Psalms. Go to Psalms. 150 chapters. Right? So there's a reason that God was showing the importance of music. We see throughout the Psalms of Israel. What he was doing was calling on God their creator, thanking him for what he's done in their life, praising him for what he's done, and who he is, and what he's going to do in their lives, acknowledging who they are. Right? Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. There has to be an acknowledgement of who you are before you can see who Jesus Christ really is. You don't accept a savior if you don't think you need to be saved. So there's that acknowledgement of who you are as a person first, Reaching out to a Christ who died for you, who rose from the dead for you, who is sitting at the right hand of the Father for you, saying, I need that. The world doesn't need a Savior. They don't think they need a Savior, which is why they haven't accepted one. If they really thought they needed one, they would have accepted Jesus by now. And God is bringing them to a point, both individually and as groups. Sometimes you see it through the Bible. God deals with a group of people. He'll deal with a country. He'll deal with a nation. Or He'll deal with the individual. But He's bringing them, who don't know Him, to a point where they see their need for Him. That's a good God. A good God does that. A good God lets you be broken and weighted under the circumstances of this world and this life to show you that there's no hope here. There's no hope in the natural. There's no hope in this world. There's no hope in the sins of your flesh. There's no hope in what the devil has to offer. There's only hope in Jesus. That's it. So God did through the entirety of the Old Testament. He pointed them to a Jesus who would come, a Redeemer, and a sacrifice. And now He points us back. What we just did here does exactly that. This is not a ritual, routine, or tradition that earns you anything from God. God doesn't have the count, although He knows, doesn't have the count up in heaven of how many Lord's Supper services you've been to. Right? And is going to reward you based off that. Because that's not grace. That's not how God works. God works on a basis of grace, which is unmerited. Unmerited means you can't work for it, you can't earn it, you don't deserve it, but God will give it to you based on your faith. And it's all about faith. Right? A life of faith is difficult. I'm not going to, you know, you know, Dylan spoke earlier about how he had a word early on in his walk. It's going to be difficult. It is difficult. Every time you think that this life is, is not going to be difficult, or why is it difficult, remember what Jesus endured while he was on this earth. All right? The world wants to paint, and I was really hoping I didn't have to go this direction today, but I, the Pope, all right? This whole thing with the Pope, we're just inundated with the Pope. Did you see how the Pope was received by and large by the world? By the unsaved masses? Oh, he's great. And I'm talking about like speaking before, you know, secular <coughs> groups. Oh, he's great. He's great. Beware of that. Jesus wasn't treated like that when he was here. Yes, he had some that accepted him early in his ministry, but look where he ended up. He ended up nailed to a cross because of his message. Jesus said, I came to bring division. He said that he would turn people in the same house against each other. He said he came not to bring peace but a sword. This is Jesus Christ who said this. We don't reach out with a message of, you're good as you are, sir. You're just, you know, you found your own way to God. That's nice. Pat on the head. No. Say, I love you. I don't hate you. Which is why I tell you what's worked for me and has worked for millions of others. The only true heart change that's out there, which is accepting Jesus Christ by faith. That's the one and only way. Jesus said it. If you have an issue with that, you don't have an issue with me. You have an issue with the Bible. The Bible. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. That excludes every other religion, every other possible means to get to God that exist. There are no other ways. There is no name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. <clears throat> Jesus Christ, that and that alone. When you preach that, there will be conflict. There will be turmoil. There will be those who don't want it. Right? If the unsaved world approves of your message, there is a problem. We're going over the Old Testament today in the book of Kings. And you see, even when you, you know, read through the books of the prophets, these men were tortured. They were not accepted with open arms. There were times they were listened to, but by the, for the most part, they were martyred in stone. 
And that's why Israel was dealt with the way they were dealt with by God. I've sent you the people to correct you. I've sent you the right message and you've rejected it. Okay? Psalm 90, verse 1. Psalm 90. This is a prayer of Moses. Okay? This is a, a, a prayer from Moses. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, your God. You turn man to destruction and say, Return, O children of men. For a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it is past. And like a watch in the night, you carry them away like a flood. They are like a sheep. They are like a sleep, sir. In the morning, they are like grass which grows up. In the morning it flourishes and grows up, and in the evening it is cut down and withers. For we have been consumed by your anger, and your wrath we are terrified. You have set our iniquities before us, our secret sins, in the light of your countenance. For all our days have passed away in your wrath. We finish our years like a sigh. The days of our lives are seventy years, and if by reason of strength they are eighty years, yet their boast is only labor and sorrow. For it is soon cut off and we fly away. Who knows the power of your anger? For as the fear of you, so is your wrath. So teach us to number our days, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Return, O Lord, how long? And have compassion on your servants. Oh, satisfy us early with your mercy, that we may rejoice and be glad on all our days. Make us glad according to the days in which you have afflicted us, the years in which we have seen evil. Let your work appear to your servants, and your glory to their children. And the beauty of the Lord, our God, be upon us. And establish the work of our hands for us, yes, Establish the work of our hands. I'm going to minister a short message this morning entitled, Return, O Lord. Let us pray. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord. We praise you. We thank you for what you did 2,000 years ago at Calvary, Lord, how all of humanity was pointed towards that before, and now all of humanity is pointed back toward Jesus. I ask that in these last days, however many may be left, we don't know. But Lord, that there may be a mighty moving of your Spirit upon this earth, you've promised it. That in the last days that your Spirit will be poured out upon all of the earth. Lord, I pray that more and more come to a knowledge of you, Lord Jesus. More and more find out who you are and what you've done through us, Lord. Through the word that you've given us, Lord, as the church. Lord, we're able to go forth and share that word with others. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. So there's th three parts to Psalm 90. Man disobeys, God judges, man repents, and then ultimately the restoration of God. Turn to Romans chapter 8. Romans 8, the New Testament, it's right after the book of Acts. Romans chapter 8, verse 5. <clears throat> For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. So there's a sin nature in each and every one of us when we're born, right? David said in Psalm 51, and that could be my mother conceived me, and sin my mother conceived me. We're all born with a sin nature. I hope I don't need to tell anybody this. Right? Nobody needs to teach you to do the wrong thing. You need to be taught to do the right thing. You're born with an inner bent towards sin. Now, that doesn't mean you're as bad as you can be. It doesn't mean you end up with a life in prison for murder or, or a horrible crime. But it does mean that you have a heart that is naturally bent towards the things of this world. Naturally bent towards doing things in your own power. That's the flesh. The flesh isn't always what we think the flesh is, where we just see someone acting terrible. Oh, they're just sinning out loud. They're doing as much as they can. Look how wicked they are. The flesh is any means that we use that's not of God. The flesh is anything that we try to do in the natural. The biggest example is trying to save ourselves by our own works. That's the ultimate example by the flesh. It started in the Garden of Eden. Man sowed a fig leaves to cover their own sin. That was the first institution of religion. The first church of the fig leaf. Right? Adam and Eve did it. But what did God do? He ripped those things off of it and clothed them in tunics of skin. Showing them, one, there need to be a sacrifice, and two, it would need to come from God. Alright? So man institutes their own ways of doing things, and that is the flesh. That's what the flesh does. That's what they were tempted with in the garden. The devil said, not, oh, you can be as wicked as possible. He said, you could be like God. 
You can do it your own way, man. You're created as God's highest creation. Why do you have to listen to Him? Go do it your own way. Cain, he takes that a step further with his offering of, of vegetables upon the altar, a way that God didn't ordain, nor did God ask for. But did it look nice? I'm sure. Did it take him a lot of work to do? Probably much more so than Abel. Abel merely slit the animal's throat and threw it on the altar and burned it up. Cain had to harvest these vegetables, grow them, should have polished them up, I'm sure, or put them on there. To God, look at all that I've done. He said, that's not enough, nor will it ever be enough, nor will the work of your hands ever be enough to enter into my holiness. Because that's what it's all about. Remember what happened in the garden? Man was kicked out. That was a type of man being pushed out of the fellowship of God. Without sin, man can have perfect fellowship with God. Perfect. God will not abide sin. God will not be in the presence of sin. He, he doesn't tolerate it. He doesn't have it as part of his, his existence. He, he doesn't deal with rebellion towards himself. That's what sin is. Sin is a rebellion towards God. God doesn't abide it. He won't stand in the same place as it. Which is why in the Old Testament, the unrighteous dead didn't go to be with God when they died. They went to paradise. Yes, they were comforted. No, they were not in the burning side of hell. But they were not in the presence of God. When Jesus died, he went down into paradise. He led captivity captive, which means those who were still captives of sin because the full sin debt was not paid for and were still stuck in paradise, even though they were comforted, he led them up to heaven. Because now faith in the blood of the perfect sacrifice who is Jesus Christ, would allow that sin debt to be paid to the degree where it satisfied God's wrath and God's judgment and allow man to fellowship now in the presence of God. That wasn't available before. So being in the flesh, don't think being in the flesh is just, you know, somebody who's so outwardly bad. And we see that. I mean, we all do it. I do it. You know, maybe just I do it. I don't know. But you see somebody and you go, well, that's really, you know, they're doing all the things wrong. Gambling, they're using drugs, they're fornicating. They're in the flesh. Me, oh no, 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 not me. Me, I'm, I'm good, I'm real good. Right? You're just as much in the flesh if you're trusting in your own works to get to God as that person in who's wallowing in their own sin because that is sin. Sin's in here. It comes out of here and here and everything we do, but it starts here. And when there's a heart that says, God, I got this. I can do this. I can figure this out on my own. I can set up rules and regulations and traditions to get to where I need to be. You've es essentially frustrated the grace of God. You've said to God, I don't need your grace working in my life every day to lead me, to guide me, to trust in. But I've devised the system. And they're laws. That's what laws are. They don't have to be the, the actual Ten Commandments or Law of Moses. Just any rules and regulations that you set up a church, sets up, whatever it is, to try to live for God in your own power. Because you even know you can't do it, at least without the law, right? The law in the Old Testament was added because of the transgression. Man was so bad, they at least had to put something in place to try to keep them in order. But that's just as much in the flesh. You know, the best example I can use is the one I lived when I was in the Roman Catholic Church. And the Roman Catholic Church, let's, we've got to get this straight. When I speak of the Roman Catholic Church, I don't speak necessarily of my sweet 89-year-old grandmother who's in there, or your friends or your family, because I don't know their hearts. I don't know what they believe or what they, they honestly trust in. But I know what the Catholic Church, the Catechism of the Catholic Church, and the teachings of the Catholic Church make public. That's what I'm referring to when I refer to the Roman Catholic Church. I hope you know that. We have people in here who have come out of the Catholic Church and we're saying, so I'm not talking about the people. But if the people trust in what's being taught, no, they are not saved. Because the Catholic Church is very clear on this. If they're clear on anything, they're clear on this. That your works play a part in your salvation. Meaning that you have a part to play. Yes, Jesus died on the cross 2,000 years ago. They'll say it. They'll sing about it. I'm not saying they don't. But where they go painfully and eternally wrong is that you have a part to play alongside the work of Jesus. Where you need to bring as Cain did the offering of your own hands, of your own good deeds, alongside Jesus' perfect and complete sacrifice in order to go to heaven. Which is why there are so many rules and regulations and institutions that you must follow in order to be in good standing with the church. Okay? Which is why I find it bad to go back to this, but if this is where the Lord is hitting on, then fine. Is that the Pope, I do not hate the Pope. 
I have never hated a pope ever. I hate the institution of the pope, what the pope represents. The pope represents a mediator between man and God. That's what a priest is. That's what the definition of a priest is. You realize that, right? One who stands between man and God. And in the old covenant, it was absolutely necessary because man, because the sin that had not been paid by Jesus, was not able to enter into God's presence in his own power, right? That blood, that perfect blood had not been shed. The penalty of sin had not been washed away. It had only been temporarily covered. So man needed a priest, which is why God instituted the priestly tribe. You know, coming from the descendants of Aaron, the tribe of Levi, he instituted the high priest, right, who would enter into the Holy of Holies once per year. But do you remember what happened when Jesus died on the cross after he gave up his spirit? The veil that separated man from God was torn in two from top to bottom, meaning God tore it, not man, God tore it. And he said, you can enter in. And now we can enter boldly into the throne room of his grace. Not in our own boldness of how good we are, but in the boldness of knowing in the one we trust in, who is Jesus Christ and what he did at Calvary. That's why I can't stand that in. Now, I will use that word. I won't use it on a person. I'll never say I hate a person. But it is okay to hate things. And I certainly hate the institution of what a pope represents. Because the people on this earth do not need to go through a priest to get to God. They need to go through Jesus Christ. Him and Him alone. He is the only way to get to God. Remember what He said? And many will be deceived and many will be confused and say, I'm not using it for that way. But trust me, that is the way the Catholic Church in, intends for you to use the office of the priests in your local parish and the, and, the, and the Pope. That's how it's designed. That's exactly why you confess your sins today and ask for absolution. Okay. Let's give a little bit of time. All right. So now man disobeys what comes after that, the judgment of God. Galatians 6, please, if you can. Galatians 6, please. Galatians 6. Verse 7. This is, the, this is a, a verse that you can use in regards to divine justice. When somebody says, oh, karma, I do good things and good comes back to me, karma. Now, there's a little bit of truth in that error, right? It's not some supernatural force that's just floating around determining what's what. It's the divine justice of God, right? And God is fair. God is just. Chapter 6, verse 7. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For if he sows to his flesh, will he reap of the flesh corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. So the judgment of God cannot be escaped. There is no place upon this earth where you are free from the judgment of God. If you sow to the flesh, you will reap the fruits of the flesh, which is destruction. Where does sin lead? Sin is a law, like the law of gravity. I drop something, it falls. It's going to happen every time. Where is the law? What is the law of sin? Sin and death. Sin leads to death. Sin leads to destruction. Death is not only when you're in the casket, but it's also a spiritual separation from God. The word death just means separation. It's a separation from the body, okay, from the physical body. But it also speaks of a spiritual death that slowly eats away at you as you sin, as you act in open and unrepentant sin. God understands you're going to fail. I'm, I'm not preaching some empty holiness message that makes you just feel convicted but doesn't show you the way out. You are to live free from sin. But the way to live free from sin is by faith. Faith in what Christ has already done to free you from sin at the cross. And if you believe in that every day, God will supernaturally send His grace into your lives to help free you and break the chains that still hold you, whatever they are. Maybe an unforgiving heart. Maybe an angry heart. Maybe an ass. But even, even the outward sins are symptomatic of something that's in your heart. But He will do that as, as, a, as the, the skillful creator and builder that God is, will build in you what you need, brick by brick, line upon line, precept upon precept, as you go through this journey, and as the world and others see you going through this journey, it is a testimony of who Christ is and what He can do. God doesn't make you perfect at the instant you believe because He wants others to see you going through what He has to offer. That He does work upon His people in their hearts. That He does help those who are in need. That Christians will fail at times. But that they know who to trust in. 
the world's not the, the biggest mistake, one of the biggest mistakes we can make as Christians in, in regard to our place in this world is to think that the world expects us to be perfect. The world, that is not why we're here. We're here to shine the light of Christ. And the light of Christ is a Savior, a merciful Savior, who is saving humanity. And by seeing what they are do, Christ is doing in us, no, I'm not perfect. Yes, I have struggles, but I trust in God. And yeah, I'm going through something tough. And yeah, this is, this is bothering me, but I trust in God. And He'll get me through. They see a hope that they do not have. The book of Peter says, 1 Peter, 2 Peter says, Always be ready to give an answer for the hope that you have. Because the world will see it and some will ask. And some will desire to know, what is this hope that you have that things will get better? What is this hope that you have as you struggle? What is this hope? And you can say, it's not a what, but a who. The man, Christ Jesus. And here's what He's done for me. I've done bad things. I've thought bad thoughts. I've been bad places. I've got to a point, Dylan said it earlier, <coughs> I've felt the same way where I didn't want to live. I've shared this before. I've been there. But I have hope now. I don't live like that anymore. Do I struggle? Of course I do. Do I have trials? Do I have tribulations? Of course I do. But I have hope. Even through that, I have hope. That things will, one day, be, you know, I will be in a place where there will be no crying, there will be no fears, there will be no tears, there will be no sickness, there will be no sin. I will be with God forever. And I also know that each and every day upon this earth, it will get better. Oh, you mean you'll have more money? Didn't say that. You mean everybody in your family is going to get saved and love you and it's, things are just going to be... I didn't say that. But what God puts into you uh, is greater than what's in the world. Do you understand that? God doesn't always change the world around you to make you happy. He changes you to say, it doesn't matter what I see in this world, I have peace. It doesn't matter what I see in this world, I have joy. Don't wait. Don't think God's not working because your circumstances aren't aligning the way you want them to. He's still working in your heart. And it may be at a time where you are enduring something as Paul did, where God doesn't take it, but he, he fixes what's wrong in you to deal with it. Where he says to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. So my grace will be greater than this that you go through. So yes, you can still rejoice. Well, give me an example, Adam. When Paul and Silas were in a Philippian jail, they weren't crying. They weren't questioning God. It says at midnight, they were singing hymns and praises unto God. And God did change their situation. He shook it. They weren't looking at the bars they were in. They were looking at the God they served. Just like when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were thrown into the fiery furnace and it was turned up hotter than it had been before. They didn't look at the furnace. They looked at their God. And their God met them there to help them, to endure. Right? And they weren't even touched. It said their clothes didn't even smell as of smoke. So the flesh will lead to corruption. In whatever way, whatever manner you follow it, it will lead to the same place. But let's see man's response. Because we can all fail. We will all fail. Go to Psalm 51. Maybe the greatest example, uh, I, I dare to say that, the greatest example of repentance within the Word of God. And I'm telling you this because you will fail. You will. Psalm 51. You will fail. I would not be a minister of the Word if I told you you were going to live sinlessly perfect the rest of your life. It will not be the case. We don't glory in failures. Shall we live in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How that we are dead to sin live any longer therein. There's a difference between living in sin, living under the power and dominion of sin, serving sin, as opposed to a believer who's serving Christ who fails. That's David. David was a believer. David loved God. Right. David was referred to as the man, a man after God's own heart, but he failed. Right. What did he do? Psalm 51, verse 1. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Against you only I have sinned, and done evil in your sight that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin my mother conceived me. Skip to verse 12, please. 
So we see his repentance, and what is he asking for in verse 12? Restore me to the joy of your salvation, and uphold me by your generous spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners shall be converted to you. The joy of following God. There is no other joy in this world but the joy of following Jesus Christ. What the world offers is not joy. It's a temporary cover-up. It is a temporary distraction from your true need. That's what the devil does. He's a liar. He's a deceiver. He points you in the wrong direction. That's how the devil works. And the devil will say, this worldly music will give you joy. I've heard it. I've heard people say, this music gives me joy. It makes me happy. And there's God's not within a million miles of it. It has nothing to do with God. Because remember, God created music. Created it. He created it for Him. And He created it for us. When we worship Him and praise Him, that we receive a blessing in doing so, that we receive joy in doing so. We see the supernatural effects of music. So Saul was comforted by songs that David played on the harp. We see uh, you know, a, a peace in one's spirit. When pray, and I can attest to this personally. When praise and worship is offered up to God, offered up as a sacrifice to God, God sees our faith in that. That takes faith to do that. It takes faith to say and believe that there's a God in heaven who does and says who He is and what He does. And then that is always given, the grace of God always flows through that. Well, how much grace do I get if I exhibit this much faith? That's not how faith and grace work, remember? It's not a, a work reward basis. You evidence faith, you open yourself up to the grace of God. One day you may need plenty of it. I'll tell you the other day, I was, I was hurt. I mean, I was hurt. Agonized. Hurt. And the Lord sent the grace that I needed for that time. There'll be times where maybe I'm not in such distress, where I'll still feel the grace in the presence of God. Right? But maybe not to the degree I felt it before. It doesn't mean he's not working. He's always working. But that's music here. But the joy that we have of following God. And then it's through faith in the cross and by grace. He says when you're restored, essentially, and, and it's, you know, he said it to Peter, Jesus said it to Peter, when you were restored, you know, uh, you know, restore them, your brethren. It's the same thing. When you are restored here, it says, teach transgressors your ways, and sinners shall be converted to you. It's not about being perfect. It's about following God. It's about trusting in God's Word, allowing Him to work in you, and allowing that be the method by which people are one to Christ through you. You may have a ministry here on this earth that sees one soul saved, or one million souls saved. It doesn't matter. That's not the purpose. God's not in the, the, the reward business for how many are saved because all we do is plant and water and God gives the increase anyway. So it wasn't you if they got saved, all right? It's our obedience to God, to His plan, to what He wants to do. So when you come to Him His way, when you repent from the ways of the flesh and you come to Him the way that He is intended, God will bless you with His grace. When you come to Him by faith in all avenues of your life, nothing being held back, nothing being at a level of comfort that's so great that it can't be surrendered to Him, that God will reward that by His grace. So we ask today, as I close, we ask today, return O Lord. If there's something you've been struggling with today, if there's something that's been weighing heavy on your heart, if, if there's a sin that's been dominating your life, Turn to Him today. Repent from whatever that is. Lord, I don't want to live like that. I don't want to go the way I've been going, Lord. Help me. Restore me to the joy of my salvation, Lord Jesus. Bring me to where I need to be, Lord. And restore the joy of my salvation by genuine repentance and faith. Amen. Amen. Well,